So we have some experience now in creating Jupyter notebooks and writing in narrative and including equations and so on. We want to move now onto the code blocks and to develop the basics of writing our code. We have already seen that we can define variables on the fly and we don't need to do any kind of preparatory um, work like we have to do in other languages where we have to define the variables up front or allocate memory to variables. So in Python, it's pretty straightforward. You just define a variable and set its value uh, as you like. So uh, we can perform all the usual algebraic operations. And in this video, we want to look at our control, the flow control in our programs. So this is not just loop control, this is program flow control. So the first one, of course, uh, if then else, and we can see here the syntax for that. So if, and then our Boolean condition or our criterion check. So if A is more than five, then go ahead and print that A, uh, that then you can take some action. And in this case, I chose to just print out that fact. So the syntax here, again, you, um, you use the keyword if, and then you include your criterion, and then you include the colon. So that instructs the compiler that what follows is going to be the code block to be executed if this criterion is met. And then the code block that follows must be indented in Python. So this is, in a way, one of the drawbacks of Python. Um, in, in in most languages, we use the curly braces to uh, to s disaggregate the code blocks, but uh, in Python we we just use tabs, and we can use uh, as as many lines here as we like. So if we want to, uh, for instance, print uh, something else here or perform some operation here, we can do that as many times as we want. So if we go on after this to uh, write some other code here, then this is considered a separate code block. So let's run this. So you can see here, um, definitely A is more than five, so it's gone and printed the first line and the second and, and so on and then it's exited that code block, so we are no longer in the if part of this, and then uh, the program goes on to print out the remaining uh, code here. So that's the if part. Um, well, that's if then, right? And then uh, we can also uh, make more sophisticated statements. So our criterion can, uh, can include and and or, so in Python, we use a single ampersand for the and, and uh, we use the, the vertical line. I'm not sure what that character is called, but that's an or. So here, this is the condition. If A is more than five and B is less than six, then go ahead and print that statement. And now we are introducing the else. So the first code block, right? Remember, use the colon to denote code block and then go ahead and indent. And then we are saying, if that condition is not met, right, then else is uh, executed. So we are saying else go ahead and run this code block. So if we run this here, uh, yes, A is still more than five. And that's something I didn't mention before. If we define a variable in this code block, then that's considered part of the, um, th that's written into memory and, and it will, uh, carry over to the next code block so we don't need to redefine a here if we don't want to change the value and now uh, we are introducing another variable v uh, sorry b so we know a is more than five here clearly b is uh, not less than six so it shouldn't run this code block it should um, only run this code block right this is the um, this is saying that th uh, this is the false of this statement. So if this is not met, then go ahead and do this. So if we run this, we can see here it's saying A is, um, this should say not more than five. So I should say here not more than five, right? So um, that's the else part. 
and then you might want to fine grain your test so you might want to say um, if a is more than 12 or so uh, here um, as I said above here um, that's an and so both those conditions must be true in this case an or so either of those conditions or both of those conditions can be true there is a, a ZOR condition, so exclusive OR. It must only be one or the other. That's true, not both. Um, but uh, I'm not showing that here. So anyway, um, this is the OR. So you can have that either this is true or this is true or both can be true. So if either of those is true, then uh, it will run this code block. And now... Um, if we want to say else if, so if this is not true, then go ahead and check another possibility. So if this is not true, and we can see it's not going to be true, right? A is 10, which is not more than 12. So this is not true. Then it's a, uh, we are looking here and, and uh, for else. So if that's not true, then please check uh, whether A is more than eight. So A is more than eight. And so this will be true and it can go ahead here. And now we see else here. So else means uh, if the conditions have not been met up to now, then go ahead and, and run this block. And now clearly we have met a condition in one of uh, these. So we don't expect this block to run. So if we run this, we can see we are getting the result A is more than 10. So this one runs and this part does not run. So that's how you can create if, then, else, and else if statements. So those are, of course, uh, the basis of uh, loop control or flow control in our programs. Um, moving on now to the while loop. So a while loop is a loop that contains a criterion for the loop to run, and the loop will terminate if the condition is violated. So here's a simple example. Uh, we start out with a value for i of 1, and our while loop has this condition that while this condition is true, while i is less than 6, then we want to uh, print out that value of i, and uh, and then we need something that's going to change the the value in the criterion check. Otherwise, this loop will never exit. right? So if we increment i, so we've started from 1, and then we'll go through 2, 3, 4, 5, and then when we reach 6, then the condition is violated. Uh, 6 is not less than 6, so then this becomes false and, and the program uh, exits. And in fact, to see that a bit more clearly, let's also print here uh, exited loop. Let's run that, and you can see here i has gone through those values one two three four five it reaches six the condition is violated and so it will exit the loop and run what's outside the code block so it says here exited loop so um, that's the basic while loop and here's just a note uh, to be careful that we don't get stuck in infinite loops so we want to make sure that we initialize this value of i correctly so if, for example, we set a value of i uh, for i of 7. So if i is 7, you can see here that i is, uh, well, I, actually this will exit because it's testing whether i is um, less than 6. So if i is 7, it, it will just never run, right? So if we set i is 7, it never runs this code block because it's never true, right? The condition is never met. Um, however, if uh, we don't include for some reason this increment in i, if i is not going to increase, then i is always going to be less than 6 if we start with a value of 1. And so this loop will run in principle forever. So um, we have to be careful that uh, our loop has a finite run. Uh, we do want it to exit at some point. So we have to be mindful of that, uh, especially when using while loops. Um, yeah, some examples uh, of that here. I'm not going to try and run these. I don't. Um, when you run infinite while loops, you tend to consume a lot of memory, and uh, 
um, and well, in fact, you should do it. You you should go ahead and run this. And uh, so, if you are new to coding, uh, go ahead and run it. See what what happens. And uh, you you can't really be said to be progressing in programming until you've gone and gotten stuck in some while loops or infinite loops. Sometimes you can also use um, uh, you can include. Uh, some tests for running for a long time. So there are these break and continue statements available. So it's uh, usually a good idea to include a loop counter. So uh, if you're running a while loop quite often to make sure that this code is not uh, going to get you stuck in a in an infinite loop, um, we sometimes add an iteration number. So we set uh, the, the, cur the current iteration of the loop to be one and uh, we set a maximum number of iterations so for instance here we say we don't want this loop to run more than 10 times and then you see here in the criterion test we are using a, a kind of compound criterion test so our primary interest is in this value of i but we also include this iteration check um, just so that whatever else is going on in this loop this loop is not going to run forever so we set an iteration number uh, initialized and then uh, we increment that iteration number and um, and this loop will r only run uh, up till the maximum number of iterations. So if we run this one, you can see here after 10, right? Uh, in, in, this, uh, in this increment, there was a kind of error. So I is never going to cause the the criterion to be false so this loop would uh, run forever if we hadn't included this iteration check here so that's um that's in a slightly better uh, loop control when using while loops moving on to for loops um, you can view a for loop as a special instance of a while loop and uh, i'm saying here the original for loops because uh, for loops have, of course, been around since uh, the beginning of programming. And <clears throat> in the early languages, a uh, for loop was automatically a loop that was initialized with a loop counter. Um, so you had some variable in the loop. So in this case, we would say for i, and you would set uh, a starting value and an end value. And sometimes you could set an increment value. Um, so here's that example. So we are running i from a value of 4 up till but not including the value of 9 and i'm just going to comment out this other stuff here we'll look at that just now so this is um the for loop we are running it um from 4 up to and not including 9 so if we run that you can see here uh 4 5 6 7 8 right um now we could also, as I mentioned, include an increment value. So here's an example of that. So we are saying now um, run i from four to nine using increments of two. So we expect this to go four, six, eight, and then stop there. And you can see that's what we get. So that's how for loops were originally um, sort of conceptualized and used in, in most of the early programming languages. In today's modern programming, it's uh, rarer to, to write a for loop with such sort of manual control. Um, so today we work mainly with, with the, what's called iterators. So an iterator lets you work through some object. So it lets you work through the contents of an object. It lets you loop through an object without manually specifying start and end and increments and so on. So for example, if we have this array here, so A is this collection of random numbers. And then we could, of course, create a for loop. So we could uh, say here, um, I want to, so I'm not going to use this code for now. So we could say, let's create an i uh, looping variable. And I want it to run from the first value of a. And then I know there are five values here. So perhaps I want um, 
uh, 6, but then, well, 6 is the 5 if we are counting over an array. So now I'm, I'm going to uh, print out the ith element of my array A. And uh, that's a bit of an error here. I shouldn't have an incrementer, or I can set my incrementer to 1. So now we can see it is running through all these uh, values in the array. So we can do that manually. We can say initialize to one. We can think about how long that uh, array is set to that value and, and loop through. But the modern style is uh, to use a for in method instead. So when using for in, um, we, uh, we specify the object here. So we say, um, we can read it in this way. We can say, for uh, the ith element of A, um, for the ith element, which is a part of A, in other words, run through A using the variable AI for that ith element of A, then print out AI. So let's clear that and run this. And you can see it's run through all the values uh, that we have here. So this is much more compact. We don't need to think about where to start and where to end. We don't need to think about how long this array is. It makes it easy to go ahead and add more values to that array. And we know that uh, that's going to work. So that's an iterator. And you can see um, that more sophisticated objects usually include an iterator. So the syntax for um, name of the element in uh, the object uh, that syntax still works. Here we are importing the NumPy library and we'll go through how to import libraries uh, in uh, uh, in the, the next, uh, not the next or the next after video. Um, here we are using linspace from that library uh, to create a linearly spaced set of numbers from one to two using five points. And then we are just looping through that array of numbers here assigning AI to the ith element of that A. And you can see it's giving us um, all those numbers. Um, sometimes, however, we, we do need the index, right? Um, so in this approach, we never uh, saw the index. We never saw 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, but sometimes you need that index. Sometimes you want to use that index, especially if you are referencing some other array in the same for loop. So if you do want to extract the index, then you take the object that you've created and you enumerate across that object. So that will translate that to uh, a list that uh, we can extract the index from. And so if we print out um, this, um, if we, we print out the results of this style of looping where we are extracting the index, uh, we print the index together with the ith element of that array, you can see here that uh, we are getting the correct index number. Right, so that's how we can loop through and accomplish four loops in Python. And that gets us pretty far in in working through our numeric uh, through our numerics and computation um, we'll look at in the next one uh, defining functions and the beginnings of creating our own libraries